Our next speaker is Daniel Rafaelich, who has worked, um, he's working as a PhD candidate at the University of Zagreb, and his thesis is on the misuse of Egyptology in uh, Third Reich cinema. He uh, studied for his diploma in Egyptology at the University of Manchester, and has recently published on ancient Egypt and film in A History of World Egyptology, which came out with Cambridge University Press last year. So thank you for bearing with me, everyone online. I'll introduce Daniel once more, once more. So thank you, Daniel, over to you. Thank you once again. Hello once, once again. Uh, the opportunity to speak about ancient Egypt and film is something that really I really cherish, but because of the known uh, events of the past years, that was very, very seldom. So I will start with the few telegrams. First one is from Carter to Carnarvon, uh, when he's saying, uh, cinema questions are best left to your hands, which means that as early as January of 1923, the film offers started to bombard the two the two men, the two men who were the, the excavating excavating the tomb. Second one is much more interesting. It says offer ten thousand dollars in profit sharing arrangements for exclusive motion picture rights to Tancamen's tomb cable reply. It's Murray Garrison one of the producers from the era, not all successful producers, but he offers a lot of money, the 17th of February, 1923. So obviously Carter and much more Carnarvon were extremely interested in filming the, the things they are witnessing and not only filming documentary because British Pate and all the other newsreels of the era has done that more or less successfully. But they, are, they were very, very interested in doing the feature films about their endeavors. So first huge offer came from Samuel Goldwyn, one of the very, very interesting and very, very rich producers from, from that time. And he said that he will bring to life the Carnarvon vision of the excavation and everything that was happening. And now we are approaching March of 20. Three, and of course, in April, Carnarvon was unfortunately dead. So in, in, in the March of the same year, Carnarvon wrote, not screenplay, but I would say treatment, pointing out the topics he wished to include in the motion pictures uh, that are portraying Carter and his endeavors. However, he didn't live to see it. Uh, when Carnarvon died, uh, motion picture companies immediately jumped on the topic and said, OK, we'll do Tutankhamun. The main financier is dead, so we can do whatever we like. But then the question arose, who is Tutankhamun? What is his story? What do we film? What do we portray? And they said, OK, let's move back to, to the Bible, so, <laughs> <laughs> which is always the safe, the safe for the motion picture. So what they did, they filmed the film called The Sklaven Königin, Queen of the Slaves, or the Slave Queen, however you want to, 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 to interpret that. It's the movie based on the Henry Ryder Haggard novel, Moon of Israel. It's one of the most expensive films ever filmed in Austria. Uh, uh, it's, it, it had thousands and thousands of extras. The city of Tanis was erected right next to Vienna. And of course, people loved it, audience loved it, critics also loved it. But it was the first film that included the props that were very, very fresh. Look at your right side. There's a bust of Nefertiti, which was several months prior to filming unveiled in Berlin. And the second photo, of course, the famous couch from the tomb of Tutankhamun, uh, the one, of course, from the antechamber. Uh, this was the first film ever that really used the props in a mundane way, not the ceremonial way, but you can see the basic, the basic idea. Uh, influence for the visual style of the film was, of course, Lawrence Alma Tadema, because his painting and his canvases were very, very rich with, with, with props and with the Egyptian feeling, so Austrians immediately jump, jumped on it. While the film was filming, while the Queen of the Slaves was filming in Egypt in summer of 1924, uh, producer Alexandra Sasha Kolovrat said, OK, let's try again to use the Tutankhamun story. So he cabled the producer on the field and said, 
while you are do doing the most expensive Austrian film ever, you will film an additional film as well. So <laughs> it, it will deal with the Carter and Carnarvon, but you cannot mention their names because of the lawsuits and you know who, who, who knows what can come out of it. So um, the uh, Hans Thayer, the, the, the director, come, came to Egypt with his actors. And these are his, I wouldn't say memoirs, but his text about filming, filming in Egypt. So the, the first, uh, first paper, you see the, the up there, Tut Tutankhamun filmed, the Tutankhamun is filming. There he in great detail explains how he and his cameraman and his crew entered the tomb and filmed the mummy of the king, 1924, filmed the mummy of the king, how the mummy was awakened during the night, they were hearing voices and everything, then they escaped into the desert, then they were lost in the desert. And this article talks about how the film crew was lost in the desert for, year, for, for days, and maybe they were killed by the Bedouins who want to revenge the, uh, the intrusion into Tutankhamun's tomb. So you, you can see the uh, film combining uh, PR techniques that are present even, even, even today. The only picture we have from Egypt, from filming of this film, which will, which will be called The Re Revenge of the Pharaohs, the Rache der Pharaonen, is this one. And it's the, the one made in front of the Giza, one of the Giza pyramids. Uh, film was highly promoted in the uh, Austrian and German press of that time. You see it down there, number 16, the Rache der Pharaonen, the, Re the Revenge of the Pharaohs. And it was the time, this is the January of 1925, it was the time of the big uh, spectacle and audience loved it, critics loved it, as I, as I said, and success was more or, less, more or less guaranteed because it was financed from the money abroad. But during that time, as you know, in Germany and in Austria, there is a huge inflation. So uh, mar marks doesn't, are, aren't worth anything. However, the movie owners from the States and from the UK, they finance the film by buying the rights for the distribution. So in Germany and Austria at that time, they have, let's say, hard currency, which is not related in any way to the inflation. So this was success guaranteed. Um, first. Uh, posters and, and leaflets and uh, announcements of the film were published in the papers. Uh, al almost every one of them is saying that it's something very, very big, something very, very exotic, something very, very smart, very exciting with the mysticism. And it's, this one is very interesting for me because it clashes two revenges. Down there you, hear, you have the, the, the revenge of the Pharaoh and up there is revenge of the Kriem Hild. That's the second part of the Fritz Lang film, the, the, the Nibelung and the Nibelung. So we have two revenges at the same time in the Austrian cinemas. So the story of the film tells the story of the wealthy Lord and his daughter. They're coming to Valley of the Kings. Uh, with the daughter's future fiance, uh, they ask Egyptian government to give them permission to dig in Egypt, which of course Egyptian government permits them. So with the permit, they start to dig. However, the national nationalists in Egypt, especially the nationalist party, are completely opposed to it. We have several pictures uh, preserved from the film because film is from for unknown reasons still. Uh, unlocated and unfortunately lost. These are the Egyptian nationalists in the film. On the right is Gustav Diesel, extremely popular film actor, especially during the sound era. He is called uh, Mustafa Kemal, uh, and he's asking the Minister of Public Works to stop the digging, uh, to stop the searching for the Pharaoh's tomb because this is the desecration of the Egyptian history. However, minister, minister tells him the permit has been issues, issued and we cannot do anything about it. So big party is held in one of the houses in Luxor. So all the our, uh, characters are present there. Here on the right, you have uh, George Harrison. That's, that would be Howard Carter. This is his future fiance. Uh, she, she is, of course, called Lady Gladys, Gladys Spencer, probably Lady, Lady Evelyn Herbert. That's, uh, that's the Lord Henry Spencer, her father. And of course, 
who, uh, the nationalist, and this is Leila, very interesting character. Leila studied Egyptology in London together with Harry Spencer. He proposed to her and she said no. And now 15 years later, they meet again at the party. So we have intimate, intimate drama as well. <laughs> However, uh, Egyptian nationalists try to do everything to stop the digging. So what the first thing they, they, they try to do, they try to drug George Harrison by giving him uh, the press says special cigarettes. So, <laughs> and you see him here, obviously drugged with multiple exposition of him up there as well. And of course, Mustafa Kemal hating him so much, you know, influencing him to stop the digging, but that, that of course didn't work. So, uh, tomb of the king has been found. However, Mustafa Kemal enters the side chamber and in the side chamber he on the wall of the side chamber he digs a small hole and through that small hole this is him preparing poisonous dart so he can kill lord spencer as a revenge for desecrating the pharaoh's tomb of course please notice the uh, surroundings the scenery of the side chamber of the burial chamber and of course this wonderful lamp down there this is lord being shot in the neck, almost dying from the poisonous dart. However, he didn't die. And Mustafa Kemal then turns to his Layla and says, now it's up to you. You must stop Henry Spencer. Sorry, George Harrison. You must stop George Harrison. That's Howard Carter-esque character. Uh, from committing any further desecration, you once loved him, now kill him. And she said, no, I won't do it. So of course, the fighting issues in, in the tomb and uh, Egyptian nationalist is killed. Uh, however, when he dies, he kills Layla and the daughter of the Lord comes to save, to save George Harrison. And of course, happy ending is unavoidable. <laughs> however, again, the setting is extremely, extremely interesting. We have borrowed couch not only not from the Tutankhamun's tomb, but from the prior film, Disclav and Königin, or Moon of Israel. Notice this statue, which looks very familiar, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what I found extremely interesting in this setting is this, are these feathers and stuff down there. And if we would just add the basket, you, you would know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. So uh, they were paying meticulous attention to the recreating the whole, the whole story and the whole and the whole idea. Uh, what that taught us and what that showed us was that the interest of the film people for the story uh, from that time, uh, big probably biggest story of that time was huge, and that they were freely adapting, let's say, all the data they could find in the yellow press, and they were kind of shoveling it out in the film, in the film script. However, there were attempts even in the States to film again, the several biographies of King Tut. One of, one, of the, one of them was Dancer of the Nile, very famous, but unfortunately lost film. And that wasn't, of course, unfortunately wasn't preserved, but uh, at that time you can see the shift. We were talking earlier today about this shift from the bio of King Tut Tutankhamun to this, I would say, rebuilding of the whole story. So we have all this, uh, certain aspects of the uh, searching for the tomb, finding the treasure and gold, and of course, completely imaginary, imaginary stuff. And you now you have the recipe which lasts even until until today, uh, as uh, late as not, I think 2018, we saw the TV series Tut, you you know the the, the three three parts film or TV series. Uh, in it, you also saw this kind of melange of different, different stuff. But this was very, very interesting to see that only in 2018, we were first time, so to say, allowed as an audience to watch the biography of Tutankhamun on a big or small screen, however we want to call it. So that means that uh, we are still not prepared to see the real bio of King Tut. Uh, we were prepared and we are prepared to see 
the real film bio of Howard Carter. We saw it, ITN produced film called Tutankhamun about Howard Carter, of course. <laughs> and it was quite, I would say it was, it was, quite, it was quite, quite good, but as we said earlier in this conference, we can't expect from, expect from the film to be uh, precise, to be biographically punctual. It has to be, it has to resemble much more to the dream. So um, the lost films about Tutankhamun from the 20s are still something that people are searching for. Uh, I was yesterday granted the privilege to see some, several films in the British Film Institute in London. Uh, Samuel Goldwyn produced in 1917 a film called Thais about the late antiquity, nothing to do with Tutankhamun, but his earlier films are, are preserved and the ones he produced about Tutankhamun wasn't, so he hasn't. So there are still hope that several of those films can resurface or will resurface somewhere. Uh, but in Austria, one of extremely interesting film has come to life. It was called Tutankhamun Comic, Comic Tutankhamun, a uh, film that was done in 1924 again. Uh, it was done by a Frenchman called Raymond Dandy. And this Raymond or Raymond Daidin came to Vienna and did a parody about the Tutankhamun or Tutmania, if you like. It was a film that showed how uh, all the staff and help around the villas around Vienna are so obsessed with the Carter, Carnarvon and Tutankhamun stories that they were start, start to dreaming and imagining themselves on the court in Amarna, right next to Tutankhamun. And of course, this led to burlesque. So <laughs> it, it's extremely interesting to see and try to reconstruct several of those, of those films and hopefully uh, one day, Macon will have a book that will cover the whole, the whole, uh, the whole stuff. And to conclude, uh, bear in mind that in those days we haven't touched the topic, this topic at all. Uh, on the radio, they're playing and the records are selling hugely successful songs about Tutankhamun, as you know. So that 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 being the most famous one, uh, and being the being the most the most published one. So. It was really something that really entered the, the I would say, proto-mass media. Uh, and still there are lots of uncovered things, lots of things that aren't covered by the film cameras that could be filmed. One of the probably most interesting thing for me, if I'm thinking now what should, should be filmed, is the politics of the Tutankhamun tomb, the fighting of Carter and Carnarvon as an First act and second act, of course, is the Carter and the Egyptian government in 1924 and 25, which was tackled in the series, but I think it could be much, much more, much, much more serious. Uh, so these are the topics that still needs to be addressed, and we will see what does film industry industry prepares. Um, it's very, I don't know, very strange that this year when we are marking the centenary nothing out of the Hollywood has appeared. So maybe something is in preparation. We are not aware. So we'll wait for the uh, November <laughs> beginning or the end. <laughs> so, and then, then we will see what, what, what's, what's going on. But to conclude the whole, the whole story, the basic idea is that it's completely, uh, I would say only 10% or 15% of the motives has, has been used. That's why this is so exciting to expect what awaits us in the following in the following years thank you